Hi, welcome to True Crime and Coke. This podcast is about true crime, disappearances, conspiracies, and anything really strange or unusual. And I drink a whole bunch of Diet Coke while doing it. Also, you can email me at truecrimeandcoke at gmail.com with any stories you would like to share or any recommendations and i also have an instagram page under true crime and coke that i would love for you to follow and if you want this podcast to continue please subscribe and rate me five stars i would really appreciate it thank you hi this is eve welcome to episode 22 and i just thought i would let you know that it is from russia and so expect to have a lot of names and places pronounced extremely incorrectly. So let's get started. I first have to tell you about a man before I can get into the whole murdering stuff. And his name was Anatoly Yemelinovich Slivko. And he was born on December 28th, 1938 in Izerbash, Dagestan, ASSR, Soviet Union. He was born in the heart of rural Ukraine, which was still recovering from a devastating famine at that time. Slivko suffered from insomnia and ate very little as a child, which made him emaciated. When he was still a child, his father was conscripted into the army, or also that means enlisted. So his father was enlisted into the army in the war against Germany, where he was imprisoned, but later returned home, only to be ridiculed upon return. As a teenager, Slivko had to suffer bullying at school for his father's assumed cowardice. Reportedly, he also suffered from hydrocephalus, which is water on the brain, at birth, which later caused several genital urinary tract issues, which included bedwetting as a child and erectile dysfunction as an adolescent boy. Due to all the external and physical issues, he was ashamed of himself and remained isolated from his peers during most of his early years. He failed his entrance exam to Moscow State University, following which he did national service for a while. As an adult, he moved to Stavropol on the Rostov Oblast in 1960 with the job of a telephone engineer. In 1961, at 23 years of age, Slivko happened to witness a gruesome traffic accident in which a boy in his early teens was killed. Slivko's younger sister actually had moved in with him into Stavropol and arranged for him to meet with a local girl because she saw that her brother wasn't really attracting any female attention. So she she introduced him to this woman named Lyudmilia, and they actually went on to get married in 1963. They had two young children, both boys, and actually remained married for 17 years. In 1963, Livko founded a club for children, and it was kind of like a Boy Scouts club, and it was destroyed in a fire. So that really sucked, but in 1966, he took charge of another boys club called Cherjid, and it was in the Russian city of blah 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 blah. So these kids would see him as a Soviet man with a heart of gold who was allegedly guiding the youth to the correct way in life. So like I said, this was similar to a Boy Scout Club, and it was very popular with children, parents, and community members. And in fact, he was the recipient of multiple letters of acknowledgement and honorary certificates for his work with the youth club. And local newspapers and radio stations regularly published articles about Slivko and Cherjid. Slivko even made amateur films, which he produced during his free time, and for which he actually won several awards. He made amateur documentaries about German atrocities in World War II. Slivko, who led an apparently normal life, switched careers in 1971 to become a school teacher and finally settled at a mining school in Shakti near Rostov until he died at age 51 in 1989. So this sounds like a good guy. 
He had a rough start in life, but he managed to become an upstanding citizen, father, and cared enough about the youth that he wanted to help out with the clubs. So it's too bad he died at such an early age at 51. But don't ever judge a book by its cover. This was a Natalie Slivko story, but with many important details omitted. So let's go start the story again and fill in those details. Let's go back to the part in 1961 where at 23 years of age, Slivko happened to witness a gruesome traffic accident in which a boy in his early teens was killed. Well, that did happen, but there are more details. In fact, he witnessed the traffic accident involving a drunken motorcyclist who fatally injured an early teenage boy who was wearing a young pioneer's uniform or like a boy scout's uniform. He later insisted that watching the boy experience convulsions in his death throes as the smell of gasoline and fire permeated the air made him sexually excited for some inexplicable reasons. And let's also go back to the part of the story where Natalie Slivko's younger sister had moved in with him to Stavropol and arranged for him to meet with a local girl named Leah Milia after she realized her brother failed to get female attention. And of course, he went on to marry her in 1963. They had two children together and remained married for 17 years. Okay, so yes, that all did happen, except one detail was left out. You see, despite the fact that he knew himself to be homosexual since his adolescence, he went on and married her anyway. And according to Slivko, throughout the 17 years of marriage, they had sex less than a dozen times. And why he really wanted to help out with the youth boys clubs was not because he had a heart of gold. If he even had a heart, it would be black. And here is the real reason why he wanted to help out with the youth clubs. In 1963, he began exploiting his position at a children's club to lure the young boys to take part in his contrived experiment, which apparently stretched the spine of the subject through controlled hanging into unconsciousness. Before each experiment, he would dress up the boy in a young pioneer's uniform, like the boy in the traffic accident, then would polish the boy's shoes and would instruct him not to eat to avoid vomiting. After successfully making his victims unconscious, Slivko would strip them naked, molest them to satisfy his sexual fantasies, and in most cases would even film the whole incident. So how was he able to talk these young boys into doing these experiments. How he persuaded 43 boys to take part in his experiment was that he would first form a close friendship with a boy, usually aged between 13 and 17. The boy would be short for his age. Slivko would then gain the boy's confidence and tell him of an experiment he knew which involved a controlled hanging into unconsciousness to stretch the spine, after which the boy was assured that Slivko would revive him. So that is how where the core of 21 years, Slivko managed to persuade 43 boys to take part in this experiment. During a period of 22 years, he sexually exploited 43 boys, most of whom resumed normal life after gaining consciousness, oblivious of what previously happened. Slivko kept the clothes and shoes of his victims as a memento and, in 36 cases, filmed the experiments presumably to keep himself occupied till he could lay his hands on the next victim. However, in seven cases, mere molestation could not arouse him enough. He went on to murder his victims, dismember their bodies, and set their limbs on fire after pouring gasoline on them. And what does this sound like? Yes, he was trying to recreate that traffic accident fatality that he saw where the gas in the air sexually aroused him. That's what he was trying to relive. His first victim was a 15-year-old homeless boy later identified as Nikolai Dobrzev, and he was killed by him on June 2nd, 1964. According to him, he was unable to revive him back from unconsciousness, which 
prompted him to dismember his body and bury him, and he destroyed the film and photographs as well. He killed his second victim, Alexei Kavalenko, in May 1965, which marked a long gap till his third victim. Well, why do you think there was a long gap? Remember when I told you that Slivko had led an apparently normal life and he switched careers in 1971 to become a school teacher and finally settled at a mining school near Rostov? Well, let me give you some additional details about that. He, in fact, did switch careers in 1971 to become a school teacher and he did finally settle at a mining school near Rostov and this was because he was forced to move from school to school due to several complaints of indecent assaults on young children. Then a 15-year-old boy named Alexander Nesmenov went missing in blah 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 on November 14, 1973. Then 11-year-old Andre Pogosyan went missing on May 11, 1975 after participating in Slivko's video recordings in a nearby forest. So even though the police knew that they went missing after they were going to participate in Slivko's video recordings in a nearby forest, the police did not apprehend him because of his fame for filming his World War II documentaries. Both of those two missing boys I just spoke of were members of the Cherjid Club that Slivko managed, and that connection became even more prominent after another 13-year-old boy from the club, Sergei Fatsiev, disappeared. Well, not much is known about his next victim. Vyacheslav Kovistik was killed in 1982. His final victim, Sergei Pavlov, disappeared on July 23rd, 1985, after he went to meet Chirgid leader Slivko. While investigating the disappearance of Sergei Pavlov, prosecutor Tamara L., I'm not going to even attempt to say her last name, became interested in the activities of the club Chirgid, but could not find anything illegal. However, while interrogating young boys at the club, many mentioned suffering temporary amnesia, especially during the experiments that Slivko conducted. Prosecutor Tamara finally was able to connect the various disappearances with Slivko after a long inquiry, following which he was arrested at his Stavropol home in December of 1985. Upon being arrested, Anatoly Slivko told the investigators that none of his victims were above the age of 17 years old. Well, one reason behind that is that he wanted to relive his experiments of the traffic accident of the youth in his early teens, but he also feared that he had be overcome by his victim's physical strength. He later led the investigators to the bodies of six of his victims in January and February of 1986, but was unable to locate the first one. You might ask, how could people not notice what he was doing? If children were being hanged and possibly disappearing right after? Well, most of these kids were actually resuscitated with the first aid techniques that Slivko assured would work, but some of them, which Slivko knew that their parents were too irresponsible and dysfunctional to care, those ones would become his victims of murder. And the victims were really hard to find because once he would dismember, mutilate, and dispose of the bodies after being calcined enough to not be recognized if they were to be found. And he'd keep the victims' shoes and all of that stuff as mementos, so there wasn't really anything for them to find or recover. In 36 cases, Slivko revived the boys and they were cautioned by Slivko into silence and just resumed their lives unknowing how lucky they are. They didn't even realize they were molested or anything. In between murders, the pictures he took and developed on his own, he would masturbate to until he had the need to have to kill again. He was accused of seven murders, seven counts of sexual abuse, and seven counts of necrophilia, and was sentenced to death in June 1986. However, he wasn't immediately executed for his crimes, enabling law enforcement to interview him in 1989 
in an effort to gain insight into the mind of another Soviet serial killer who had been terrorizing Rostov since 1978 that ended up being Andrei Chikatilo. So Slivko cooperated with the investigators, telling them that the unidentified serial murderer probably killed his victims for the same reason that Slivko took the lives of seven boys. It was the only way that he could achieve an erection and sexual satisfaction. So the authorities didn't think Slivko offered anything that was practical for the use of their investigation, so he was executed hours after being interviewed about it. He was executed by shooting on September 16th, 1989. So this was a short case. However, what it does have that a lot of cases do not is pictures and videos. I will post a link for you to access the videos that are available and some of the pictures if you would like to see. Of course, they are awful and children are involved, but I will provide those. And don't ever judge a book by its cover. And until next time, have a good evening.